hello everybody. So today we will be finishing the Lily Alexandre video, uh, TERFs are wrong about biology. And for me, it has just been a, a ceaseless slog of technical difficulties. Uh, the first time I, I recorded the video, I was delayed because my camera ran out of battery and then I didn't have the right adapter. But, you know, I'm not going to go through it all. Although the last video was definitely the worst where I had the, the issues with the microphone. And then on top of that, it then took ages to actually render. Like there were some issues of it and I had to like fiddle around with that. Goodness me, it was terrible. Uh, I'm hoping this time I, I set everything up, checked the recording uh, to see how it sounded, and it seemed to sound fine. Uh, however, I'm not entirely confident. I think after I'm done with this little introduction, I will go back and listen to it just to really make sure that it sounds fine. Of course, in a way, that's almost annoying because it kind of means I don't know what caused the uh, audio to sound so terrible last time. So for all I know, it could happen at any other point in the future. So I guess I'm just going to have to be uh, vigilant and make sure to double check how my audio actually sounds before I start recording. But yeah, very uh, irritating. But obviously I don't want these technical issues to distract from what it is that we do here. We go through these videos made by these ideologues. We see if they have any good arguments. We see how those arguments stand up to scrutiny. And that's what we're going to be doing in this video. It's what we're going to be uh, finishing up doing. I imagine that this final section is really going to be getting into the nitty gritty of biological sex. So it'll be interesting to see how long this ends up being. Uh, you know, obviously you'll know that if you just look down there, you'll see a little timeline thing. It'll tell you how long you've got to go. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's going to be a while if I don't stop rambling here and get into the video. So hope you enjoy. For a supposedly objective thing, Transweb's definition of sex is real slippery. And if it's so fundamental to their movement, you think they would have agreed on it beforehand. Okay, so real quick, uh, objective is not the same thing as simple. Objective just describes something which isn't up to your interpretation or isn't up to human interpretation. So quantum mechanics is objective. And I think that pretty soundly uh, shows that the standard for objectivity isn't simplicity. According to TERFs, we should talk about sex, not gender, because sex is objective and totally separate from culture. They That's not really it. Um, I mean, apart from anything else, again, if you're using the word gender to include gender expression, I don't think anybody's saying we shouldn't talk about gender expression. Gender expression very much does matter. Uh, however, what we shouldn't talk about is gender identity, because gender identity's got nothing to do with anything. It's it's not, um, it doesn't exist in material reality. The thing is, uh, you say separate from culture, that's not really, I don't think that's what people are saying. People aren't saying we should do what's separate from culture. Uh, rather, the reason why we should talk about sex is because sex is uh, the m appropriate material referent for what makes somebody a man or a woman. And the reason for this is that being a man or woman is something which historically was observed. People were observed to be men or women. It wasn't theorised uh, by you know a bunch of kind of postmodernists uh, back in the in the caveman times. At the beginning of patriarchy, women were, of course, uh, oppressed by men, and the way that men identified who was a woman was not self-identity, it was who was a biological female. Uh, that's why sex matters, that's why sex is the important thing to talk about, and the most kind of analytically useful category when talking about the oppression of women historically. Oh, and also in the present day. I don't know why I just said historically. It's also in the present day as well. That sex is inherently more in touch with material reality. But that. Well, yeah, definitely sex is more in touch with material reality. I don't see how you can disagree with that. That doesn't gel with the simpler definitions they've latched onto lately. Okay, so apparently the claim there is that at least some of those claims, I'm not sure how that could apply to material reality. I mean, I'm not sure in what way uh, the simpler definitions of sex are out of touch with material reality, but let's see. The thing about gametes and chromosomes is they're invisible, microscopic. If <laughs> I like how two words were said which contradict each other. You have invisible, which means can't be seen, and microscopic, which of course the scope there is referring to 
your ability to see things the scope is like your field of vision i think is technically correct um and i believe a telescope is is so cool because it kind of transports your you know like like teleport it like um transports your field of vision i'm not sure about that but certainly microscope is because it makes your field of vision able to focus on that which is incredibly small I, the fact that i'm saying the word vision right now should give you a clue as to, and okay uh here's another little etymology lesson for you invisible the suffix in is saying not like incredible is is not credible uh a bit like um you know what's being said by lily alexandre but invisible not visible N- visible as in vision I, I know i'm laboring this point but it was just quite funny <laughs> someone walks by you on the street, they don't know what your chromosomes are. Even a doctor can't say for sure without running tests. Okay, yeah, so I'm ready for this. Yeah, I I mean, I I knew this was basically the point that was trying to be made. Um, And the better word would have been um, immediately perceptible, which is the word I, or the rather phrase, let's be, you know, but um, that's that's often what I say. I talk about, you know, this idea of uh, people's sex being immediately perceptible. Uh, And often I'll talk about how people's sex uh, is immediately perceptible because most uh, reliable signifiers of somebody's sex are immediately perceptible. For example, you can immediately tell that I am biologically male, uh, but it is true that there are some aspects of sex, and indeed some aspects of sex which might be in some sense the truer aspects of sex, which uh, aren't immediately perceptible. Um, now there's two issues with this. The first one is that this is putting a focus on uh, gametes rather than uh, phenotypes. And I already kind of touched on this in the earlier video, but I'll just kind of go through it again. Uh, basically, when we talk about um, gametes, that's literally just what's there. But when we talk about phenotypes, we're talking about what it is that your body is geared towards. Um, and, the, you know, for example, if we talk about things being broken, uh, something which is broken doesn't cease to be that thing. So philosophically, this important distinction is actually quite intuitive. Uh, We all understand that uh, something's ability to perform a function is actually not what defines that thing. Rather, what that thing is clearly intended to do is what defines that thing. So a broken television no longer becomes completely separate from the referent of its function as a television. A broken dishwasher no longer becomes uh, completely separate from the referent uh, as uh, a function or it's the the referent of its function uh, as, um, I don't know if I said dishwasher or washing machine, uh, whichever one I said, uh, it's, it's not detached from that. So we might for a second kind of be a little bit confused by that. I mean, you would be inclined to say that the thing that makes a television a television is that you turn it on and it shows you all of these visual images. The thing that makes a dishwasher a dishwasher is that you put your dishes in it, you turn it on, and your dishes come out, and they're clean. If your dishwasher doesn't do that, then uh, surely it's no longer a dishwasher. But then at the same time, isn't that a little bit of a self-contradictory statement? I'm saying if your dishwasher, like to what am I even referring when I say your dishwasher doesn't, it should be completely incoherent to say your dishwasher doesn't wash dishes. But we we know it's not incoherent. We know that actually saying your dishwasher doesn't wash dishes is a completely reasonable thing to say. And the reason for that is because we can recognize that even when your dishwasher is not able to wash dishes, it's still geared towards the function of washing dishes. Uh, And in an exactly identical sense, if a biological male does not produce small gametes, you might say, well, hold on a minute, isn't, isn't that what's supposed to define a biological male? The production of small gametes? But actually, again, if you say My, this biological male doesn't produce small gametes, that should sound like a completely self-contradictory thing. Because it's like, well, if a biological male is somebody who produces small gametes, then how can you say that a biological male doesn't produce small gametes? It's like saying a dishwasher doesn't wash dishes. But why do we know it's a biological male? Why do we know this person is a biological male? Because we can recognize, just as we can look at a dishwasher and recognize the function of that dishwasher, even when it's not actually able to fulfill that function, we can similarly recognize the function of uh, a human body 
in you know in this sexually dimorphic species we have we can recognize what a human body is geared towards the production of uh, and that's an important distinction so it's not the actual production of gametes itself it is the um function the apparent function of the human body in question uh, even when it might not actually be able to perform uh, that role in sexual reproduction we can still recognize uh, and i'm using the word it um, just just because i'm imagining it it as just a, a, a person personalityless uh, body but obviously it would actually presumably be a, a, a human individual so what you may have realized already is that while gametes themselves are not perceptible the function of producing gametes is much more immediately perceptible uh, and i don't think i really need to stress that point because essentially what i'm saying is that we are a sexually dimorphic species on innumerable points and uh, that actually, even when there are differences of sexual development that cause variability on those points, uh, it's still very easy to recognize whether or not somebody is a biological male or a biological female. And indeed, what uh, underpins that uh, easy recognizability, uh, that seems like it's not really a proper sentence, but um, what underpins that is the perceptibility of these differences. But I also think that just to add a kind of extra layer of debunking onto this, uh, this is ignoring a uh, key feature of a lot of definitions, which is that uh, how we perceive the actual reality of a particular thing is not always going to line up with how we might define that thing. Uh, and obviously, one of the really obvious examples of this is that there's many things we can perceive before we've even been able to properly define those things. Um, and, you know, I mean, you could kind of, I, I, I feel like I might get in some philosophical trouble if I try to uh, be a bit too simplistic about this, but I think you could probably apply this to things like time. Like, we can perceive time before we even, like, defined time uh, or, you know, defined temperature and things like that. Uh, but I think, and, you know, obviously there's, in mathematical concepts, this works as well. Uh, for example, before anybody came up with the concept of zero in mathematics, it wasn't as if that concept didn't exist. Uh, it wasn't as if um, people suddenly, you know, it's not as if people didn't have the concept of doing nothing to a mathematical equation. It's rather that they just didn't have this idea of uh, formulating it as a mathematical concept. But I think maybe a slightly more appropriate example would be uh, species. So the definition of a species and what makes something a different species is very complicated. Uh, it really is. Uh, but that doesn't mean people were unable to recognize different species before then. Uh, it didn't mean that like people were just like, well, it's a, it's a lion and a human and they're the same. Uh, but actually, what is it that defines a species? Well, the definition I've heard, and again, I'm sure this definition probably, it's a definition I learned in secondary school, so I quite strongly suspect it's not actually the kind of perfect definition. But the definition I always heard was that uh, a uh, species is defined as being uh, that which, well, you have two species when you have two organisms which cannot produce viable offspring with each other essentially. Now, here's the thing. That's not immediately perceptible to somebody. You know, that's not just something I can, I can't just see something and recognize, oh, that, that, uh, you know, like if I see a monkey and, you know, I know monkeys are not a species, um, I don't know, a, uh, specific monkey. <sighs> I, I, I'm realizing now I don't know the names of any monkeys, really. Fine, okay, let's go for um, a primate instead. If I see a bonobo and a lion, I don't actually, you know, it's not immediately perceptible to me, nor was it perceptible to a lot of people in the past, that those two things, those two animals, couldn't produce a viable offspring with each other, but it was still perceptible to me that they were fundamentally different organisms. So what I'm trying to stress here is that there is a very established idea of like you noticing there are these differences and then the job is, and you know, it's something which I covered in a previous video and I wish I could remember what video it was, uh, basically this idea that actually a lot of the time 
people have definitions that in effect work backwards, that you notice the thing first, and then you start trying to define it. And yeah, I, I do remember covering this before, uh, and I think it's a really worthwhile point to remember. Like That's how science and philosophy and just describing the world works a lot of the time. You notice something, you notice two different groups, two distinct um, things somebody can be, and then you think, well, how do I describe this? How do I define it? Uh, and that's basically what's happened with biological sex. Like the reality is you can notice biological males and biological females exist, but actually uh, how you define a biological male or a biological female is a matter of working backwards. And it might be that by the time you get to your perfect definition, your perfect definition is uh, slightly removed from how people actually perceive biological males and biological females. Uh, the reality is that, yeah, we didn't need uh, all of this like idea of like people's gametes and chromosomes and all of that to know that biological males and biological females exist, but we did need it to say very clearly, well, this is what makes somebody a biological male or a biological female. Uh, so yeah, that's just a point worth bearing in mind. How could chromosomes be so essential to the oppression of women when most of us don't even know for sure what our own are? Well yeah, okay. Oh, wait, okay. So I'm, I'm you know what? I'm going to let, so there was a well said there. So I'm going to see if Lily Alexandra is going to anticipate uh, a response that I might give. Oh. Chromosomes are important for sex determination because they tell your body what to do as it matures, what happens in the womb, during your puberty, and so on. They're instructions. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, I guess, kind of accurate. I mean, really, the point is that, uh, again, how you define specifically what makes somebody biologically male or biologically female uh, is, well, I mean, yeah, it's basically what I already said. It's not the exact same thing as how somebody perceives whether somebody's a biological male or biological female. The reality is that for thousands of years, of um, nobody knowing what chromosomes were, uh, biological females still existed knowing that they were biologically female. Uh, and society knew they were biologically female, most likely, uh, because of, for example, uh, gendered expression, which was intended to make it more immediately obvious to people that biological females were biological females. Uh, and even if somebody defied gender expression, perhaps with the explicit goal of not having it be known that they were biologically male or biologically female, they still had, having been already raised as being biologically male or biologically female, or at least knowing themselves that they are biologically male or biologically female. So yeah, the point is that the perceptibility of biological sex, uh, you do need to, to some extent, divorce it from whatever perfect definition we arrive at for what exactly distinguishes biological males from biological females. And that's not a bad thing. It's something we do all the time uh, in science and in describing reality in general. When we're talking about sex in a social context, I don't see why chromosomes should matter more than the way our bodies actually are in the world. What okay, um, so here's the thing, all right? I definitely agree that it is 100% possible for a biological male to make himself appear to be biologically female and achieve th that fantastic, clearly a uh, very desirable goal of people thinking that he is biologically female and treating him as though he were biologically female. Uh, I think that is a very real possibility, but that will never be equivalent to a biological female who has been treated as a biological female simply based on the material reality which she didn't choose. That's the point. Um, it's not, nobody is saying, I mean, certainly I'm not saying that uh, there is not a phenomenon of people uh, changing the you know uh, indicators of their biological sex such that people perceive them to be a different biological sex from that which they actually are. I'm not denying that's a phenomenon. What I'm saying is that I don't see any reason why the labels of man and woman should describe that phenomenon rather than the phenomenon of biological males and biological females existing from birth uh, as the two biological sex categories that exist and that you're born into either being a male or female and there's nothing you can do to escape that reality even if you can change people's perception of that reality. Uh, I don't, yeah, I'm not denying 
that both of these things exist. I'm saying, why are you saying that woman should describe not a biological female who was born biologically female, and that's just the material reality of the situation, but instead describe uh, a bi well, it just be described or defined in such a way that could include a biological male who goes to huge amounts of effort to make himself look like a biological female. Why is that what you think should be the word, uh, or that should be what the word woman describes? I that's what I need an answer to. DNA is kind of a distraction. People don't exempt me from misogyny based on information they don't have access to. Okay, so to avoid just repeating myself, I want to point something else out here, which is that at this point, we're not anymore talking about what is biological sex. Now we're talking about this other thing, which is just people's perception of what they think your sex is. Uh, which is, of course, apart from anything else, contingent on the idea that uh, biological sex actually exists um, because you know this idea of like people thinking you're biologically female what does that mean it means you're a biological male who has done all of this stuff to make it seem as if you are biologically female to indicate that you're biologically female the same way by the way that a white person could do like various surgical changes to make it seem as if they're black you know it's the same it doesn't do anything meaningful to erase the reality that there are black people and white people that a white person can make themselves look as if they're a black person essentially what we have here is a video that's pretty much the equivalent to if somebody made a video called what is socialism and in it they spent a shockingly large amount of time just focusing on the fact that somebody could claim all the things a socialist would claim while not actually being a socialist. That's basically what we have here, a video that's supposed to be about what is biological sex. And by the way, why gender critical people are wrong about biological sex. And it's mostly just explaining what biological sex is, but then saying, ah, oh, well, you know, somebody could just make it seem as if they're a biological sex that's different from what they are. That's, that's not... That's not an interesting point. Turfs use biological sex to lay claim to some special relationship to material reality. A special relationship? By the way, uh, my hair's probably slightly different because I actually cooked and ate dinner. Um, mostly because my camera can only record in like 30 second chunks. Sorry, 30 minute chunks. 30 second chunks would be very annoying. Um, 30 minute chunks, so it reaches the end of 30 minute chunks. I was like, oh, yeah, no, no. Uh, anyway, um, a special relationship with reality. Um, no, it's, I mean, it's not like a special relationship. It's just, it's just acknowledging, it's acknowledging, it's acknowledging material reality. That's all there is to it. But their prescription of trans people's bodies as male or female has nothing to do with how we live. Okay, you say it has nothing to do with how you live. That's patently false because one of the ways you live is to try to deny the reality of your biological sex, right? You say, like, yeah, it has nothing to do with the way I live. Meanwhile, you do all of this surgery, all of this stuff, to try and change uh, the indications of your biological sex. That is something to do with the way you live. The decision you made to do all of that stuff is a thing you did in your life. Which, I mean, so, okay, first of all, you've got two issues. First of all, one... Lots of trans-identified people, they're, that they are, um, or, you know, their, their actual biological sex is immediately observable. That's point one. Uh, point two is, like I say, uh, the fact that what, even if a trans-identified male, for example, does completely get rid of all, all of the indications of them being biologically male, you can't say that has no effect on their life because it's like, well, it does have an effect on their life because it affected that decision from them. Uh, so you're just wrong, like literally unambiguously wrong. Essentially what you're saying here is, well, there's no difference between me and a biological female because we both have breasts and we both have uh, a, a, an opening where our, our, in our genital area rather than a, a phallus. Uh, and, you, and you say, okay, yeah, sure. I can accept that those are two things you have in common with biological females. But that still doesn't mean there's no difference, because there's a very significant difference. And that very significant difference is that a biological female didn't have surgery to affect all of those features of her body. Well, that's exactly what you did. Gametes, a widely used yardstick for sex and science. 
If a trans woman is on hormones long enough, she stops producing them. Hold up, okay, that's not quite right. This is true for some people, but it doesn't always happen. Hormone therapy is not a reliable contraceptive. Anyway, if she gets bottom surgery, her body can never produce them again. Well, okay, so this is literally like what I've already like addressed. <laughs> Like I already, like I did a whole thing at the beginning of this video about how the actual production of the gametes themselves is not the key point. Um, and again, this is like saying that if I uh, unplug my microwave, it's no longer a microwave because it can't heat up food. Um, yeah, it makes no sense. Instead, they opt to call us eunuchs, sterilized males. And I'm just like, where do you see that? Wait, what do you mean? <laughs> I mean, okay, so like, obviously there's a sociological context in which eunuchs existed, and I think maybe you could say that using the word eunuch to describe somebody who's clearly not fulfilling that sociological context um, is inaccurate, but if we take eunuch to just literally mean a biological male who has been castrated chemically or otherwise, um, that's what you are, a chemically castrated biological male, right? That's That's what you are? And also, I mean, I guess like physically castrated too. Both counts. Or not by what your body looks like, but by reproductive cells you may have no intention of using. Okay, so first of all, this is strange because again, like, I mean, is this just uh, unapologetic transmedicalism? Because you have to recognize that there are lots of trans identified males who just, their bodies just look like males. So I'm not even sure. Like at this point, yeah, basically you're, you're talking really about well, you're talking about transmedicalism. Does the medical uh, changes that happen uh, to a transidentified person amount to uh, that person no longer being a, uh, you know, whatever they were before, man or woman or whatever? And obviously, apart from that, most of what was just said was just like saying what gender critical people believe, but in a way as if it's not a reasonable thing to believe, which is not really a great refutation. How can TERFs claim this special connection to material reality while denying the realities of trans people's bodies? No one's denying the reality. Who do you think's denying this reality? I'm not, what, what do you think that I'm seeing right now? Like, if you told me all the things that are physically true about your body, I would say, yes, all those things are physically true. Like, what am I denying? Transphobe's definition of biological sex has nothing to do with biology. In fact, it has nothing to do with anything observable at all. This is a bold claim. The only thing they believe is that sex is how you're born and it can never change. Yeah, that's, that's biology. <laughs> that is biology. It's how you're born and it can never change. Oh, that was, that was an epic debunk. And they used to be upfront about this. Trans-exclusionary feminism branded itself as being for women born women. Well, hold on, what do you mean they used to be upfront about this? Since wh what's changed? Who's changed? Who, who, who are these people who are not being upfront about this? Like, I'm sorry, did you think that when... Uh, like, all of these other definitions for biological sex, like, you're... I mean, you literally, like, one of the things you mentioned was people defining it about your birth certificate. Like, saying your biological sex is what's on your birth certificate. What part of that would suggest that biological sex isn't? Like, what part of that is not being very explicit about the fact that biological sex is what you were born as and it can't change? It was exclusion for exclusion's sake. Wait, what are you on about? Oh my goodness, this is so weird. What... Uh, why, what are you saying it's exclusion for exclusion's sake? What, what is, what does that mean? <laughs> that just doesn't follow from what you're saying at all. Who's saying it's exclusion for exclusion's sake? How does that follow from what you're saying? How is that different? Why are you acting as if there's some kind of big change? I, I don't, I don't even like, uh, there's so much wrong to unpack there that I don't even know like, I, I just don't think I can even do anything with it. It's just like, I don't... What do you mean? What what do you think has changed? Who do you think changed it? Who, who used to say... Who used to exclude people for exclusion's sake? And when did that change? And how did it change? And in what sense was it... Ex I don't know. It's just... That's just weird. Um, like, and the problem is, like, it's just... It, it's... The reason why I don't know what to say is because it's just, like, completely... Just... Like, I don't know what where that's what that's even supposed to be like drawing on to evidence that claim 
like regardless of how you define biological sex in such a way to exclude trans people that isn't what would make it exclusion for exclusion's sake and also okay just a key point exclusion for exclusion's sake that's called a bloody definition <laughs> that's what a definition is now obviously there is a political reality behind like uh, gender critical feminism so it's not exclusion for exclusion sake but even if it was exclusion for exclusion sake that would just be what a definition is and how a definition is supposed to work like this is just so ridiculous it's like uh, somebody it's like if um you like i don't know we're really hardcore into pluto and like somebody laid out all of the reasons why uh they think that well, why it doesn't make sense to categorize Pluto as a planet. And you say, oh, so it's just exclusion for exclusion's sake. And it's like, well, yeah, that's that's the point of defining a planet, you know, to distinguish planets from suns and asteroids and whatever else and empty space. That's that's why why we why we have this definition. It's specifically to exclude things, excluding for exclusion's sake. That's that's how definitions work. It's just, it's, I, I don't know. They only shifted gears recently when their unabashed prejudice came under fire. But modern radical feminism is still like that. Exclu who shifted gears? What shifted gears? And what I don't understand is you literally started off like talking about how Janice Raymond was quite reasonable and her definition like made sense. You didn't have a problem with her definition. But now it's like changed. So suddenly it's like, oh, actually it used to be that like now, it's it's you know I guess we're just ignoring the whole like Janice Raymond having a reasonable way of defining sex or whatever else. Now it's just back in the day it was exclusion for exclusion's sake, which is not even a problem. It's how definitions work, and also not true. Um, and but now it's it's changed, so it's I I like this is the issue when somebody just talks absolute nonsense. I don't know what to do because it's just like I want to communicate to everybody how much this is just complete nonsense, but. It's difficult to do so when there's, like, when it's so much nonsense, there's nothing to, like, debunk. Like, what, 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 like, what can I debunk in that completely bizarre series of claims, none of which relate to reality, nor really relate to anything else that's been laid out in this video? It's hard to define sex in a single way that is both true and categorically invalidates trans people. No, it's not. <laughs> Because in most ways that count, trans women are female and trans men are male. At least we can be. But I, I, okay, so I like that. At least we can be. Again, like this just seems like very hardcore um, trans medicalism. Because, yeah, like to claim like this just trans women are biologically female in most ways that count. Even if we're running with what you're saying, you're therefore, I guess, assuming that every single trans woman gets all of this stuff to to change stuff and like i know there was like the little at least we can be but that at least we can be it was pretty clearly just like an aside thing um like the main thrust of what was being said is trans women are female in most ways that count probably like an at least we can be at the end just like oh here's a bone for the the people who don't seek medical transition um the fact that your your main thing is saying at least we can be it shows that that's what you think a trans woman is somebody who's gone through medical transition uh, and you know that's i would say to, to give you credit a slightly more coherent way of having trans women actually mean something um but obviously it's contrary to the idea that a woman's just anybody who identifies as a woman and yeah i think lots of people would you know lots of trans identified people would disagree with what you're saying here because the whole purpose of defining sex is excluding us, deciding who doesn't get resources or community. Uh, well, first of all, okay, again, that's the whole purpose of defining anything. But you you add that political aspect to it. Well, yeah, if we want to talk about the political aspect, um, it's to exclude you because of the threats that biological males present to biological females. That's, there we go. Um, it also is to exclude you because, like, you know, a feminist organization needs to be able to, for it to mean anything, it needs to be able to say who's a woman and who's not. Otherwise, who's it advocating for? Literally, like a feminist organization, it doesn't, a feminist organization doesn't exist if it doesn't have a clear idea of who's a woman and who isn't a woman. Because it's literally saying, oh, we're advocating for nobody. We're advocating for blah. 
Like, that's it. It's like, oh, you're, you're a feminist organization. What, what are you advocating for? We're just advocating. Blah, 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 blah. Like, if, if woman doesn't mean anything, then everything a radical feminist, or sorry, well, a radical feminist organization, any feminist organization could possibly stand for is just gibberish. Blah, 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 blah. Is. If trans people fit into their theory of sex in any way, the theory doesn't work anymore. So it has to change. Well, uh, um, well, look, here's the thing. The onus is on you to show that the theory is not valid and doesn't work. Saying, like, as, as I've already said, like, usually people, like, people very often define things by working backwards. And that's not, there's nothing wrong with that. The onus is on somebody else to show why that definition doesn't work. Um, you can't just say, well, this is what they want to do. It's like, okay, yeah, fine. That's what they want to do. Why do you have a problem with that? And here's the truly galaxy brain shit. The take I've spent the last 40 minutes priming you for. Okay. I'm so excited for this. Um, okay, ready? Turfs don't believe in biological sex. They believe in the inescapable power of birth assignment, powerful enough that its impact endures even when no trace of it remains. Okay. Um, no. It's not... Uh, again, it should be pointed out that it's not actually... Well, you say birth... It's, it's birth observation. But, like... Uh, no. The reality is that, I mean, think about this for a second. I I believe that biological sex is very significant in the animal kingdom, where the idea, the, are you going to say like that lion cubs are assigned male and female? Because I, I tell you what, biological sex matters a lot in the animal kingdom. So yeah, there we go. That's just like pretty obvious contradiction of what you're saying. Yeah, it's not, it's not about society assigning things that makes it real it's about real like objective reality they believe that birth assignment dictates whether you are a pure person who's destined to be victimized or a threat who's not to be trusted it's irrelevant like ultimately any other like uh conclusions you want to like add on to or, like any other ways you want to kind of characterize the experience of being male and female is irrelevant to the existence of the categories of male and female um you know so just like, like oh it's they think that all females are pure. And it's like, well, I don't know if I think every single female is pure and is going to be victimized by every single male. But what I do know is that males and females exist. And that's that's enough for me. Uh, if you could just accept that, that would be fine. They believe that your assigned sex at birth should determine what you can do, what you can call yourself, and who you can associate with. Um, What you can do? No. I mean, again, like, as I pointed out before, like, it depends what you mean by what you can do. What you can do in a literal, like, in terms of what's possible, yes. In terms of what, like, in a prescriptive sense, no. Although, obviously, I mean, it's some things like, for example, uh, if you are biologically male, you shouldn't um, go into an organization for biological females. The same way if you're white, you shouldn't go into an organization for black people or whatever else. Um and I guess, like, on the who you can associate thing, yeah, technically that too. But, like, who you can associate with in a wider sense, obviously not. Um, and then whatever, or what you can call yourself. Well, I mean, you can call yourself whatever, but if you don't have a good reason for why you're calling yourself what you're calling yourself, then I'm just going to be like, well, I don't see why I should call you that. I don't know. I mean, it's just, yeah, it's, it's whatever. This belief is a rigidly idealist one. What's idealist? Why is it idealist? How is it idealist to say that material reality is the only thing that matters? That's the opposite to idealism. It needs to be true or everything else falls apart. Oh, this is like, I don't like this because like what I've realized now is we're, we're at the conclusion. And I, I kind of could have predicted that the conclusion to this video is the least satisfying thing ever because we're watching a conclusion to a video that didn't make any real point. So of course the conclusion is just going to be a nightmare <laughs> because it's like the conclusion, nothing that's been said so far has evidenced any of this. So obviously the conclusion is going to be rubbish. Yeah, it's not, it's not really surprising now I think about it. Uh, but we'll just try and power through. Uh, we're definitely going to finish this video like in one, you know, like 
At least, yeah. Who knows? Maybe this will even be slightly shorter. The thing about treating sex as the most important thing and imparting deep cultural meaning onto people's bodies. Well, imparting deep cultural meaning onto people's bodies is exactly what gender critical feminists are against. So you're, if anything, you're like naming, you're like describing two kind of contradictory things there. You're describing the gender critical belief that biological sex like matters and important. And then you're describing the idea that deep cultural, like attaching deep cultural significance to people's biological sex, that's gender. That's going beyond biological sex. So like, that's not saying, but oh, whatever. Is you've just invented gender again. <laughs> that is literally where gender came from. Oh, I mean, that was that was kind of funny. Uh, so we we agree. What's funny about that is that obviously, like I I pointed that out because I was like, that's what, um, like that's not what gender critical people do because it's gender, and I guess like okay, so I have this thing. Um, it's like if if there could be um, one phenomenon in like you know kind of intellectual dialogue that could be named after me as a law like one thing that would be called king critical's law it would be this it's something i've thought about since way back when i used to like argue with anti-feminists and stuff um when if you are describing what you perceive to be a hypocrisy you need to very strongly consider the possibility that actually it's just that you have misunderstood what you're saying, where basically like lots of the time people will argue against themselves, but frame it as if it's a hypocrisy of the group they're arguing against. In this case, obviously, you have somebody saying um, that gender critical feminists enshrine all this important cultural value around being biologically male or biologically female. And then saying, this is, well, and then saying, and this would be gender. Now, I would say that this is actually Lilia Alexandre arguing uh, against, you know, the video itself, the overall point being made. Because actually, at that point, you realize, well, these two things don't add up. Gender critical feminists doing something which would literally be establishing gender should be an indication that you've got stuff wrong. But what Lillian Alexandre is trying to do is say, ah, oh, well, this just shows how hypocritical they are. And again, like that's, so yeah, like that's the thing. And it's something I see a lot of the time where it's like, what I'm seeing is somebody literally arguing against their own point. But what the person arguing is trying to do is say, and this just shows how hypocritical they are. It's very common. It's very frequent. And yeah, like I would say, that's it. If you think that you're pointing out a hypocrisy, Consider the possibility that maybe you're just arguing against yourself. I thought these people were supposed to be gender critical. It's just like so funny. This is literally exactly what I'm talking about. It's like you're, you're being like, oh, I, I thought that, you know, like you're basically, again, trying to really hammer home this point of like, look at how hypocritical it is. All you're doing is hammering home how much you've refuted your own point. That like you should at this point realize... Like, because here's the thing, like, I realize that Lily's, like, feigning this kind of, like, oh, I, oh, I guess I must just be confused. It's like, but, like, actually, you are just confused. So stop, you know, you don't need to feign it. You can just, you know, we, we can all see it. They're fighting to reinstate the old order where men and women inhabit separate worlds that can never touch. It's just, it's just wrong. Like, why do I do this? Why is this what my YouTube channel is? Just arguing against people who just say wrong things. It's just, this is what I do. This is my curse. And I'm never ever to uh, escape. Um, you know, I mean, I genuinely do think you can make some kind of a, like, um, sort of dystopian short story about me, the person who just has this channel where I argue against people who just talk Complete nonsense. Whew. This literally had so little to do with biological sex. <laughs> like I thought we we're gonna talk about differences of sexual development. We didn't we didn't talk about a single difference of sexual development in this entire video. I was like thinking that was gonna be a thing, and it wasn't. I thought we we're gonna whack out the uh 
the like um, made up sex spectrum thing that even the person who actually like first produced it has come out and said it's not supposed to be showing that sex isn't a binary. But in, yeah, instead we get instead we get this. I feel tremendous sadness for what I've experienced. Oh, damn it. I meant to um, record on OBS and I didn't, uh, which is fine. Like, obviously, I can just... Like, the recording on OBS thing was just slightly easier. Um, also, I should realize this thing was supposed to... Oh, Gadzooks. Anyway, so we come to the end of this video. And uh, what mostly do we want to say as a conclusion? Well, I think, really, it's just... Like, yeah, I guess the two things there were, like, first of all, obviously, what I already said about it being a conclusion to a video, it didn't really make any substantial point. Like, if if I were to say what the point of that video was, I, I couldn't tell you. I couldn't tell you what the point of that video was. I, if the point of the video was that gender-critical feminists are wrong about biological sex or gender-critical people in general, that was not uh, a conclusion I personally came to uh, when I was watching the video. Uh, indeed, it kind of just seemed to me like we actually have a pretty good idea what we're talking about, and that um, people like Lily Alexandre don't really have any idea at all. Um, I, I don't really know what else to say, what else to do, uh, just pretty, yeah, pretty disappointing. Um, and definitely not worth the incredible aggro of, like, all of the technical difficulties that I've had to go through bringing these four videos to you. But on that note, if you appreciate the effort, you can like, you can share, you can subscribe, you can comment below to let me know what you think, you can check out Twitter and Discord and all those things, and of course, you can always give on Patreon. Even a very small amount is appreciated, um, and obviously, yeah, like I said, oh, uh, we hit 5,000 subscribers. <laughs> How could I forget to mention that? We hit five, I don't know why I did that, 5K subscribers. Five of them. That's more than I thought was ever possible. To be fair, like, that is insane. Like, in, in some sense, it's insane. Um, like... I never, I don't know, like, it's it's kind of crazy to think um, that there was a point when I was happy with, like, my 250 subs. Um, and now we're on 5k, 20 times that number. Um, like, we're, it's, it's really nice being over the hurdle, you know, like, and things like, I was over the hurdle a while ago. But it's kind of like, when you first start off a YouTube channel, and you have zero subs, you know, like, you just don't know how you're going to get any attention. It's kind of like, you know that obviously once you get some amount of attention... Like, you can ask people to share your videos. You can do, like, all this stuff, you know. You can... There's a point at which it's just going to grow at least a little bit all the time. And, you know, like, my videos... I mean, my channel, rather, it grows at, like, 10 subscribers a day, um, at least. And, like, 10 subscribers a day, back in the day, would have been insane. Um, but, like, that's so cool that, like, you know, there was a point where I was just some guy just responding to people who I thought didn't make very good points on YouTube. And now, I mean, I'm, I'm still that, <laughs> but now, <laughs> now more people watch me. Uh, classic. Um, but oh yeah, the, the thing about it being 5k is again, you know, like, um, obviously that's, that's one reason why even just a small amount of Patreon would help because obviously, um, you know, like if everybody gave a tiny amount, then that's a lot. I don't know if you need me to explain the uh, the mathematical logic behind that, but I think it's reasonably intuitive. Anyway, um, so yeah, I'll, I having said that giving on Patreon is very appreciated, I'll just say thank you to my current patrons. In addition to the name scrolling past on your screen right now, I would like to give a special thanks to last month's patrons Ben, Julia, Nephilim, Bree, Natasha, Jasmine, and somebody who didn't want to be thanked by name, but you're all very appreciated.